Good morning. Welcome to our Bible study this morning. This morning we're continuing in our series on spiritual gifts. We're beginning a segment of our study concerning spiritual gifts where we're going to be looking at when did the accrediting gifts go out of existence. Now this is the first of five different lessons that we're going to have concerning the accrediting gifts and when they go out of existence. So just keep in mind as we progress through our study this morning, this is only one of five parts that will help us to come to a biblical understanding of when the accrediting gifts that God gave to his local churches went out of existence. Let me give you the five parts, uh, what the five parts are going to be about so you can maybe understand more how we're going to handle this subject. In our lesson today, we're going to look at the Bible text that talks about that which is perfect coming and bringing an end to the accrediting gifts. In our next lesson, we'll be looking at the biblical principle that whenever the Lord accredits his place of worship and his word, he does that in a 70-year time frame. We'll be looking at that in our next lesson. In the third lesson in this series, we'll be looking at the death of the apostles and how the apostles' death affected the end of the accrediting gifts. Our fourth lesson in this section of our study will be an, another basic biblical principle where the Lord starts things supernaturally and then he allows a natural perpetuation of those things. And again, this will be confusing for you now, but as we get into each lesson, I think it will help you to understand more clearly what I'm talking about. But that will be lesson number four. And finally, lesson number five, we'll be looking at many different prophecies that teach us that in the last days, false miracles will take place in an effort to mislead both the lost and the people of God. Okay, so well, that's our five lessons we'll be looking at in this subsection of our entire study on the accrediting gifts. For this morning's lesson, I would like us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We'll be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 8 through 13 of 1 Corinthians 13. Because here in this section of scripture, we read about the ending of the accrediting gifts. And what we're told about that is, when that which is perfect comes on the scene, that's when these accrediting gifts will come to an end. So we'll be looking at what the Bible teaches here in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13. Once again on the subject, when do the accrediting gifts of God come to an end? Listen to what's said in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I also am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Once again, that's 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 13. What I would like us to look at is take these verses step by step and work down through them and come to a clearer understanding of when the Bible teaches us the accrediting gifts of God have come to an end. Notice in verse number 8, Charity never faileth, but whether there will be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there will be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there will be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now folks, there's a lot we can learn from verse number 8. First of all, what I would like us to see is this. Everything listed in verse number 8 will come to an end except for charity. Notice how it's described again. Charity never faileth. So that separates charity out from everything else that's being talked about. What's different about charity than any of these other things? It never fails. But the Bible goes on and says, but whether there be prophecies they shall fail. The idea of fail there means the idea it shall 
uh, it shall be made useless. It shall be made to vanish. So it's saying the idea that there's coming a time when prophecies will be made useless. There'll be no need for them anymore. And because of that, they'll vanish. It goes on, it says, whether, whether there'll be tongues, they shall cease. The Greek word for cease here means the idea to be brought to a full stop. To be brought to an end. So we're told here that tongues will be brought to a stop. They'll be brought to an end. Finally, it says, whether there'll be knowledge, it shall vanish away. See the idea of vanish away there? It's the exact same Greek word that was translated shall fail when we were talking about prophecies. Remember what we said that Greek word means? It means it's the idea that it will be uh, made useless. And because it's useless, it will, know, it will then vanish away. So the idea is this. Charity never fails. Prophecies... They're going to become useless and vanish away. Tongues, it'll be brought to a complete stop. What about the gift of knowledge? The word of knowledge, in other words. It's going to be brought, made useless and vanish away as well. There's one other thing I would like us to notice in this verse. And this is a very important point, so I'm going to try hard to emphasize this and to make it as clear as I possibly can. It's the tenses of the Greek verbs that are used. And you'll see why this is so important as we get down to the next few verses. What I would like us to notice is this. When we talk about prophecies and it says they shall fail. They shall fail is in the passive voice in Greek. Simply what that means is this. Something has to act upon the prophecies to cause them to fail. They're not going to fail in and of themselves. Something's going to intervene and cause the prophecies to fail. The same holds true for knowledge. See where it says, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. It shall vanish away is also in the passive voice. When it comes to the word of knowledge, something's going to have to intervene and bring the word of knowledge to an end. Something's going to intervene and cause the word of knowledge to be worthless. And therefore it will vanish away. But if you notice, the tense of the word to cease, where it says whether there will be tongues they shall cease, that tense is a different tense in Greek. That tense is a tense that we describe as a middle voice. Okay, What that means is, the subject acts upon itself. Instead of something else acting upon the tongues to bring them to an end, you know what? They're going to end in and of themselves. They're going to, in a sense, act on themselves. They're going to be the cause of their own ending. As compared to prophecies and knowledge where something else will act upon them, causing them to end. Folks, these are very important principles, and you'll see why in just a minute. Okay, let's go on to verse number 9. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Okay. If you remember back in verse number 8, we saw that charity was separated from the rest of this group because it never failed. So we saw there were three gifts left that were kind of lumped in the same group. Prophecies, tongues, and knowledge. What did they have in common? They all would fail. Well, here in verse number 9, Paul now is separating two out of those three out of the group and is saying there's something special about prophecies and knowledge. Even though tongues is also a part of the group that will come to an end, Paul says there's something about knowledge and prophecy that makes them different from tongues. It's the fact that knowledge and prophecies are in part. He says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. What's that talking about? It's talking about how God revealed his word to mankind. He did it part by part. Every word of knowledge that was given was a part of the scriptural record. Every prophecy that was given was just one part of the whole. It was one part of the scriptural record that ended up making up the entire word of God. So when Paul says we know in part and we prophesy in part, Paul is saying, remember, when you hear 
a word of knowledge speaking to the believers back in those days. When you hear a word of knowledge, keep in mind, that's just a part of the whole. Likewise, when you hear a prophecy being proclaimed, remember, that's a part of a whole. It's not all of God's word that he means for us to have. It's only a part of it. We know in part, and we prophesy in part. Now, it goes on then, in verse number 10. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. Okay, what's Paul teaching here? Now Paul talks about something called that which is perfect. And he says, when that which is perfect is come, now listen closely, it's going to act upon knowledge and prophecy, bringing them to an end. Notice how he says it, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part, okay, what do we say was in part? Knowledge and prophecy. When that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. So Paul is saying, whatever this thing is that's perfect, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, whatever that thing is that's perfect, when it comes, it's going to work on knowledge and prophecy, bringing them to an end. Isn't that exactly what we saw in those verb tenses in verse 8? Remember when we said the idea behind knowledge shall or prophecy shall fail? It was the idea that something would work on the prophecy, bringing it to an end. And when we said knowledge shall vanish away, we said the same thing. Something would have to work on knowledge to cause it to be useless and bring it to an end. So Paul here is describing for us what that thing is. That's going to work on the knowledge and the prophecy, making them worthless, useless, and bringing them to an end. It's something called that which is perfect. Okay, folks, when you study that word perfect in the Bible, it's the Greek word teleos. Let me tell you right now, no place in the Bible is that word used to mean sinlessly perfect. It's not used that way ever in the Bible. Whenever that word teleos is used, it means something that's been made complete. All right, now please, let's just listen to this a second. When men spoke a word of knowledge back in those days, that was one part of the entire word of God. When men spoke a prophecy back in those days, that was one part of the entire word of God. When the final word of knowledge was spoken, when the final prophecy was spoken, when God had revealed everything to man that would be contained in God's word, what happened? The word of God became complete. At that instant, when the word of God became perfect or it became complete, it acted upon the word of knowledge and it acted upon prophecy, making them now useless and bringing them to an end. Do you see how much sense that makes, what Paul is teaching us here? He's saying, look, when God got done revealing his word to man, there's no need for prophecy anymore. So the completed word acted upon that prophecy, rendering it useless and bringing it to an end. When God's word was brought to completion, the word of knowledge was no longer needed. It's now useless. So it was brought to an end. So when we're talking about the accrediting gifts, a part of which involved the revelation of God's word to man, we can see they were brought to an end when the word of God was brought to completion, or in other words, it was made perfect. Okay, let's go on. In the very next verse, it says, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Okay. In verses 11 and 12 now, Paul gives two examples to help us understand what the idea of perfect is. He gives us two examples of things that are incomplete that then are made complete. 
Remember we said when it came to God's word, when a person spoke a word of knowledge, that was just a part of the entire word of God. When a person spoke a prophecy, that was just a part of the entire word of God. It was a, 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 an incomplete portion of God's word. But when the final word of knowledge was spoken, when the final prophecy was spoken, the word of God at that point was then made complete. Okay, now please understand what we're saying here, okay? The word of God in the context of how we're looking at it in this section of scripture, we're talking about how it was formerly incomplete, but then it was brought to completion. Paul now gives us two examples in verses 11 and 12 of that concept. Something that is incomplete being brought to completion. First of all, he talks here about the maturing process of understanding being brought to completion. We all know as we've watched a child grow up, when a child is really young, they have a difficult time understanding things. But as we watch that child grow and as he matures, if he's a healthy child, we'll see he has more and more of an understanding of things going on around him. He has a better ability to understand what's being told him and what he sees around him because he is gradually maturing until he gets to the point as an adult, he has the most possible understanding he's going to have. He's going to be able to understand as best he can as an adult then what he sees around him. That's the ability to come to an understanding of things being brought to completion. As he grows in age, gradually his ability to understand increases and strengthens. Look at how he says it. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Paul says, as I became mature, all of those things in my childhood that held back my understanding, they were put away. I no longer spake as a child. I was now able to speak as an adult. Why? He could understand the language much, much better as an adult than he did as a child. He understood as a child, but now as an adult, he was able to understand things going on around him and what he was told. He was able to understand in a much greater way. Why? Because his understanding had now matured him and brought to completion. I thought as a child, all the thoughts of the way that he would reason things out as a child, the things he would think about as a child, you know what? As he became an adult... All of those things changed. Those childish thoughts and the childish way of reasoning about things he put away because now his ability to think and understand things had matured. <coughs> What's that a picture of? How God's word was incomplete, but it was brought into a state of completion. In verse 12, we find another example of the very same principle. Something incomplete brought to completion. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I also I am known. Okay? Here now we're talking about the concept of understanding truth about the Lord while yet in our sinful flesh. Folks, as long as we are in our sinful flesh, this side of heaven, no one can come to a perfect understanding of the Lord. No one can, because our sinful flesh holds us back from that. So we don't come to a full knowledge of the Lord because of our sinful flesh. But you know what? There is coming a day our understanding of the Lord will be brought to maturity or to completion. You know when that will be? When we go home to be with him. When we're face to face with the Lord. Because when we're face to face with the Lord, no longer on this sinful earth, no longer in fleshly sinful bodies, but now we'll be in glorified bodies. When we stand face to face with the Lord, we'll be able to understand much more about Him than we ever could understand on earth. Because now we have glorified bodies. The sin that is in our fallen fleshly bodies will no longer cloud 
our ability to understand truth about Christ. What is that? That's having an incomplete knowledge of Christ being brought into a more mature, more complete understanding of him. That'll take place when he comes back and takes us home to be with him, and then especially when we receive our glorified bodies. Listen to how he says it. Now we see through a glass darkly. Why is the glass so dark now that we can't see Christ clearly? It's darkened by the sin that's in our fleshly natures. But then, face to face, what's going to happen? Folks, that dark glass is taken away. When's that going to take place? When our fleshly nature is taken away. When we receive glorified bodies. When we stand before the Lord face to face. Now I know in part... Paul says, when it comes to knowledge about Christ, I know bits of it, but I don't have the complete picture yet. Remember the idea of in part, talking about knowledge and prophecy previously? Where the idea there was what? As each prophecy was spoken, as each word of knowledge was spoken, that was only a part of the whole. So he says, look, now, as Christians in fleshly sinful bodies, we can only know Christ in parts. We can know a bit here about Christ. We can know a bit there about Christ. But we cannot know, have the full picture and understanding of Christ. Why? We've got fleshly sinful bodies. But he said, then, when we go home to be with the Lord, shall I know even as I also am known. He says, at that point in time, when I go home to be with the Lord, I'm going to be able to see Christ and know him much, much, much more clearly. It's, it'll be like, like he knows us, we'll be able to know him. Do you see, folks, how both of those principles are illustrations of the same basic truth? Things that are incomplete being brought into completion. But you know what's even more interesting about this whole idea? If you think about both of these examples, we can even apply them to the Word of God becoming complete. Okay, now just follow this with me, please, because this is very important. Remember we said back in verse number 10, that which is perfect, is talking about the Bible being brought to completion. Let's look at verse 11, keeping that thought in mind. As Paul speaks to the church at Corinth, he's saying, look, church of Corinth, you guys are like babies. Right now you have some of the word of God, but you don't have all of it yet. Why? The last prophecy had not been given. The last prophecy was John on the Isle of Patmos as he finished the, the uh, giving to man the book of Revelation. That was about roughly 95 AD. Paul is writing to the church of Corinth about uh, roughly 30 years before that. So he's saying, look, at this point in time, it's like we're like children. We don't have the completed word of God yet. So we're like a child. We understand like a child. We speak as a child. We think as a child. As a matter of fact, if you think about it, the New Testament wasn't even compiled yet. So basically, all the church at Corinth had to work on was, or had to use was, the Old Testament scriptures plus whatever they had been taught by Paul and the other apostles. That type of thing that was... Uh, inspired by God. Those teachings inspired by God that came from the prophets. That's the, and the apostles. That's the only thing they had to work with. They didn't even have a completed New Testament yet. Or a compiled New Testament yet. So Paul is saying, okay, based on the fact that for the most part, your scriptures are the Old Testament Bible, keep in mind, we only understand in part, we only speak in part. It's only going to be when we have the finished word of God that we're going to be able to come like a man and we can put away childish things then. What about the next one? Well, knowledge about Christ. The same thing. <clears throat> as long as the word of God was incomplete for the church at Corinth, they can never come to a, even begin to come to a full knowledge of Christ. But what happens when the Bible became completed? Their knowledge of Christ certainly became more complete. You know, once we received God's word and it, it was brought into a completed fashion, we as Christians in today's time have a much clearer picture of Christ than they did back in the days when they only had the Old Testament as their scriptural references. 
So we certainly became, we certainly received a more complete picture of Christ when the word of God was completed. Even though it's not a perfect understanding of Christ till we go and be with him. But you can see how both of these examples Paul is giving are perfect examples of the effect of the completed word on man compared to when the word was incompleted. Folks, these things just don't happen. These things, you know, as Paul is writing this, these are the type of things he has in mind as he's sharing with us about that which is perfect, working on these accrediting gifts, bringing them to an end. Now, you might say very quickly before we go on, yeah, but Brother Rob, what about tongues? Remember, they're not in part. We were told that uh, that which is perfect, it would work on that which is in part and do away with that. But tongues, we said, wasn't in part. So when do they come to an end? Very quickly, and we'll get into this in much more detail in coming lessons. But very quickly, the idea is this. Tongues came to an end in and of themselves. Meaning what? As we do our studies, we're going to see that the only way that the gift of tongues was received by man is one of two ways. Either through baptism in the Spirit by Christ, when Christ would baptize his assembly in the Spirit. That only happened twice, by the way. Once in the house of Cornelius and once uh, on the day of Pentecost. Or else, from that point forward, every time the gift of tongues was received, it was through the laying on of hands of the apostles. Okay, now stop and think about it, folks. What happens when all the apostles die off? Tongues cannot be handed down anymore. Once the last apostle died off, which again would have been the apostle John, he died, most people think, between 95 and maybe 180, something in there. Once the apostle John died... Tongues can't be handed down. Why? God didn't baptize in the Spirit after that. And the apostles, there was no apostle left to lay hands on anybody. So what happened with tongues? Well, they ceased, but they ceased in and of themselves. Nothing had to work on the tongues to bring them to an end. They just gradually died off. As each person speaking in tongues would die off after the apostle's death, tongues gradually died off. Why? There was nobody left to pass them on, so you had that one generation of people speaking in tongues, but when they died, it was over with. Nobody left to pass it down, and so therefore it died. The gift gradually died as each of the Christians who could speak in tongues died. <clears throat> That's why we saw that it will end in and of itself. Okay, let's go on real quickly again. We'll get into all that in great detail in the coming lessons. Verse 13, and now, Abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Here's what's wonderful. <laughs> Notice what Paul says. The idea of abide here means to continue on for an extended period. Do you notice he doesn't name knowledge, prophecy, nor tongues in this listing? Why? None of them were going to remain for an extended period of time. All of those were going to come to an end very soon after he wrote the book of Corinthians. Again, keep in mind, within about 30 years, the last prophecy and the last word of knowledge would be given by John on the Isle of uh, Patmos. So what Paul is saying here is this, look, you're not even going to have the accrediting gifts continuing on for any extended period of time. Here's the ones that are going to abide for an extended period of time. It's going to be faith, hope, and charity. Folks, we have those things to, to this day. But then he goes on, he says, but the greatest of these is charity. Why is charity greater than faith and hope? It's because charity, remember what he said, charity will never fail. Charity will never go out of existence. Faith and hope will. When will faith and hope go out of existence? When our Lord comes back. At that point in time, we'll no longer have to exercise faith in the Lord because our eternal inheritance will be received and we'll be home in glory with the Lord for an eternity. No more faith is needed. We'll have nothing more again to hope for because we will have received all of God's precious promises. We'll be enjoying them instead of hoping for them throughout eternity. But what's the one thing that will continue on through eternity? Our love for the Lord. Even though we'll be present with the Lord throughout eternity, we're going to be loving him throughout eternity. So basically, if you put all these verses together, here's what's being taught. Knowledge, prophecies, and tongues, they're going to go out of existence very soon. 
within about 50 years of when Paul was writing at the most, probably less than that. Faith, hope, and charity, they're going to continue to abide long after knowledge, prophecy, and tongues are done away with. But, out of those three, faith, hope, and charity, you know the greatest, it's charity, because charity will never end. Charity will never fail. Folks, what a wonderful promise we have. That God's love for us and our love for the Lord will never, ever, ever go out of existence. I hope looking at these verses helps us to come to a clearer understanding of when the accrediting gifts come to an end. Again, the, the answer would be when, okay? Knowledge and prophecy came to an end when John the, the Apostle spoke the last prophecy on the Isle of Patmos, roughly 95 A.D., from that point forward, the completed word acted upon the knowledge and prophecy, bringing it to an end. <clears throat> uh, as far as the tongues go, it will be after that a few years. Once John died off as an apostle, the tongues gift could no longer be passed on. So whoever was speaking in tongues at the time of John's death, that gift of tongues would continue on until they died off. But as each person who spoke in tongues following the Apostle John's death, as they died, that was it then. So you're talking maybe, I don't know, 10, 20 years after that, tongues went out of existence. The point is you can see the general time frame, just in general, rough numbers. You know, when you consider we're 2,000 years past this basic time period now, 20 years is nothing in the in comparison to how long we've lived now, basically you're talking around 100 AD, give or take 20 years, is when all of these accrediting gifts for the most part probably went out of existence. Now we're going to see that basic principle, the idea that the accrediting gifts went out of existence about 100 AD, give or take, that principle is going to be reestablished for us in four different ways as we study four other lines of teaching in the Bible. You're going to see every one of those four keeps pointing back to that same time period. So Lord willing in our next lesson we'll be looking at the 70 year uh, <clears throat> accreditation period and how the Lord Throughout history has used a 70 year time period to credit his place of worship and the word that he revealed to man. Look at that, Lord willing, in our next lesson. Let me just say real quickly as well, on my blog, settledinheaven.wordpress.com, you'll find this lesson, and it goes in much, much greater detail about how we can know that which is perfect is God's word. Included in that is going to be what other people say perfect might be, and why the Bible clearly teaches against those things. Like some people think it's when the Lord will come back. That which is perfect. The Lord comes back. Some people think it's when we enter into eternity. Some people think it's when Christians reach maturity. There's all sorts of different ideas about it. Well, I address all of those in this same lesson. I just didn't have time to go into all of that during the YouTube presentation. So you're welcome to go to my blog, settledinheaven.wordpress.com. And there in the blog, you'll find the lesson. It's entitled, Spiritual Gifts, When Did the Accrediting Gifts Go Out of Existence, Part 1. Okay, if you look at that lesson, you'll find much, much more detail about the accrediting gifts and when the Bible teaches they're going out of existence based upon this passage of scripture in 1 Corinthians 13. May the Lord bless you as you study his word.